If you or a loved one is getting cataract surgery, you probably expect that the hardest part will be the surgery itself. But what surprises a lot of people is that even when the operation goes perfectly, they might end up saying, doctor, why are my eyes suddenly dry, gritty, irritated, even though I never had this before? Dry eye disease after cataract surgery is common. It's under discussed and honestly a source of frustration for patients and surgeons alike. But the good news, we know exactly why it happens, who's most at risk, and most importantly, how we can prevent and manage it using the best evidence-based strategies. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rupa Wong. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist and managing partner of Honolulu Eye Clinic for the last 17 years. I've been caring for cataract patients for nearly two decades, and I want this video to give you the same kind of thorough, evidence-based, but understandable explanations I'd share if you were sitting across from me in my clinic. Because understanding why dry eye happens after cataract surgery and what you can do about it can truly make your recovery smoother and your results more satisfying. So let's start with the big question. Why does cataract surgery cause dry eye, even in people who've never had it before? It's actually multifactorial. First and most importantly, cataract surgery, specifically phaco emulsification, that's when we use ultrasound power to break up the cataracts, which is what we do in the developed world, that involves making tiny incisions in the cornea. Even though they're small and they heal well, they cut through the corneal nerves that normally control tear production and blinking. So these nerves are part of what's called the neural feedback loop. When your eye surface senses dryness, these nerves trigger reflex tearing and blinking to protect it. When they're disrupted, you lose that automatic signal. So there are a lot of landmark studies that confirm that neural injury reduces tear secretion and destabilizes the tear film, leading to dry eye symptoms postoperatively. But nerve damage isn't the only culprit. During surgery, your eye is held open with a speculum. You can't blink. The microscope light is extremely bright and it's hot, and all of that leads to evaporation and desiccation of the ocular surface. Plus, there's mechanical manipulation of the cornea and conjunctiva during surgery. That physical stress triggers local inflammation, another driver of dry eyes. And then there's the medications. After surgery, nearly every patient is prescribed antibiotic and steroid eye drops. Many of these contain preservatives like benzalkonium chloride, which is known to be toxic to the ocular surface epithelium and meibomian glands with repeated use. In short doses, it's fine. That's why we're so focused nowadays on using preservative-free drops, especially whenever possible, and especially in people at risk. Now, who actually gets this? The truth is anyone can develop dry eye after cataract surgery but some people are at much higher risk. The patient-specific risk factors include older age, so aging just naturally reduces tear production and meibomian gland function, which are the oil glands that make the oil for your tears. Female sex, hormonal factors make women more susceptible, pre-existing dry eye disease, even if it's mild or asymptomatic, meibomian gland dysfunction, systemic conditions like diabetes or autoimmune diseases such as Sjogren's. What's really interesting is that even people without obvious symptoms can have what we call subclinical ocular surface frailty. This has been quantified using the Ocular Surface Frailty Index, OSFI. And what it does is it predicts who is most likely to develop symptoms post-op, even if they had no symptoms before. Patients with a high OSFI scores, they need special attention. Then there are also procedure-related risk factors. Longer surgical duration, meaning the surgery just took a lot longer than otherwise would have. Higher phaco energy, the amount of energy that was needed to break up the cataract. We need to use a lot of energy for really dense cataract. Excessive intraoperative light exposure. Usually we try to cover that so that doesn't happen. Larger corneal incisions has been contributing. And then the use of preserved medications postoperatively. But the single biggest predictor of persistent bothersome post-op dry eye is pre-existing meibomian gland dysfunction. This is so well documented in the literature that many surgeons, including my husband who does adult cataract surgery, now make meibomian gland dysfunction assessment a part of their routine pre-op planning. So let's get specific about the incidence. If you have no history of dry eye, you still have about a 10% chance of developing new onset dry eye after cataract surgery. Typically symptoms peak in the first post-op week and patients describe 
burning, foreign body sensation, blurry or fluctuating vision. The good news is for most people without prior dry eye, these symptoms gradually improve over one to three months as the corneal nerves regenerate and the ocular surface heals. But if you do have pre-existing dry eye or MGD, meibomian and gland dysfunction, you're in a different category. The risk of post-op dry eye is significantly higher. And the symptoms are also usually more severe and the recovery is slower, often requiring three months or more of treatment. So the objective signs mirror these symptoms. You've got reduced tear breakup time, increased corneal fluorescein staining, persistent ocular surface inflammation. And patients with these high baseline OSDI scores, but low tear breakup times and significant meibomian and gland dropouts, they're likely to have persistent symptoms. So this is why preoperative assessment is so important. The recent guidelines and the expert consensus say that every cataract patient should get a basic dry eye workup, even if they don't complain about symptoms. Typically that might even just mean a questionnaire to assess your subjective symptoms, or we will take a look at how quickly your tears break up under the microscope, which you might not even realize we're measuring at the slit lamp. That helps us assess tear stability. We'll put an orange dye called fluorescein, and if it stains the cornea, that helps us detect surface damage. There's also tear osmolarity testing, which is to help identify hyperosmolarity. We do that in every one of our patients as well. And if someone has moderate or severe ocular surface disease, sometimes we actually do delay surgery in order to optimize the surface first. So that might really sound disappointing to somebody that's really eager for surgery, but it improves the outcomes and it prevents months of post-op misery. And so that's why it's so important to do. So let's talk about management, starting with the pharmacologic treatment. So the, the cornerstone really is the preservative free artificial tear. This is the same thing. If you look at the box, it'll say sodium hyaluronic based and it's going to usually be say 0.3%. They've been shown to be better, superior to lower concentrations or even of the dextran based drops. So those are the ones you wanna get and they improve and reduce corneal staining. There's also some eye drops that have trehalose in addition to hyaluronic acid and that might further improve the outcomes, especially when they're started before surgery and continued after. And then another eye drop is diquafasol sodium 3%. It's another excellent option. It's a P2Y2 receptor agonist stimulates both the aqueous and mucin secretion, both of which are needed for tears. And a lot of randomized controlled trials and analysis have shown that it outperforms standard tears and helps with the oil gland function, even in patients with pre-existing dry eyes. Usually you have to use it six times a day in the early post-op period. And for patients with a lot of inflammation or persistent symptoms, you can use short-term preservative-free corticosteroids and that might be helpful. For moderate to severe cases or cases that don't respond to treatment, topical cyclosporin A and others that help make more tears really have a good role. And then there's also emerging data about different types of fibro last growth factor and adding that to sodium hyaluronate that shows some promising results it's not anything that we do routinely right now and there are larger trials that are needed but medication sometimes often is it enough when it's alone so there are a lot of other interventions that are critical there's just things you can do at home environmental and behavioral strategies like using a humidifier reducing your screen time i know nobody wants to hear that but it can be really helpful at combating dry eye and just encouraging frequent blinking 2020 rule for meibomian gland dysfunction you want to clean the lids well do some warm compresses that Im really improves the quality of the oil and helps tear evaporation and then there are also these other types of in-office procedures you can find in a lot of dry eye clinics we do punctal plugs which you can put in to help your tears not uh, decrease so quickly. There's intense pulse light therapy, IPL therapy, and that can be combined with gland expression, which just means we squeeze on the glands of the eye to improve the tear film. And then there's also Lipiflow, which is a thermal pulsation, and it offers some short-term improvements in the way that those oil glands work. And even there was a recent clinical trial on low light therapy that was used before and after surgery, and it improved tear film stability and it reduced the discomfort. So the professional guidelines from my academy, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, they emphasize the same principles. 
you've got to do some preoperative risk assessment. That's very important in knowing who might have dry eyes after cataract surgery. Perioperative optimization is critical. You know, keeping that surgical time short, being mindful about the operating room lights. Preservative-free artificial tears should be first line for everybody. And then there are other types of frameworks which help you choose the interventions based on the severity. So I think though the most important thing is just patient education. And that's one of the most important things I do as a surgeon. And it's really to set some realistic expectations. I tell patients, I know my husband tells patients because he does adult cataract surgery now and I don't. Dry eye symptoms are common after cataract surgery, even if you've never had them before. So symptoms typically peak in the first week and then gradually improve over one to three months. So if you have pre-existing dry eye or meibomian gland dysfunction, then you're going to be at higher risk for persistent symptoms and you're going to need more intensive management. And I think just preparing patients like that helps them truly understand what to expect. And I hope this video has done the same for you in that way, because I think when you know what's coming and why, then you're gonna be less anxious, you're going to understand what's happening with your care, and ultimately, hopefully, you're gonna be more satisfied with your surgical results, whoever your surgeon is. So dry eye after cataract surgery, it's not just an annoyance. I know that it's a very real, multifactorial, it's something that really deserves careful attention. But with comprehensive pre-op screening, with really maximizing everything that happens during the surgery, and personalizing your management postoperatively using drops or other tools, we can dramatically improve your comfort and your satisfaction. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a like or subscribe to the channel for more evidence-based eye health. And if you've had dry eyes after cataract surgery, I'd love to hear what you experienced, what treatments helped, what maybe didn't help. That sharing really helps other viewers. I'm Dr. Rupa Wong, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.